Welcome to the Go See Orange Bowl. I'm Jay Rao from Miami's Community News. There are a lot of Miami Hurricane fans that claim to ha have uh, orange and green blood running through their veins, but few of them can ever top or even come close to our next guest. This 96-year-old World War II veteran has attended nearly every University of Miami home game since 1946 when he was a grad student. But he's more than just a football fan. He spent 38 years as a member of the Dade County School Board and helped desegregate Miami schools and was and is still a huge part of the Miami community. He's a member of the University of Miami Sports Hall of Fame directors. Uh, please welcome to our show, show G. Holmes Braddock. Mr. Braddock, thanks for joining us. Well, nice to be here, Jay. Um, G, uh, Mr. Holmes, or Mr. Braddock, I should say, um, you've been a part of Miami since, uh, you, you've been living down in Miami since 1946 when you were a grad student, but you didn't yeah. actually grow up here. Uh, where did you, where, where did you, uh, where were you born and where did you uh, come from? Well, I grew up at two little towns, a little town of Sebastian, Florida, for half my young life. And then I was about nine, about 10 years old, we moved right next door, four, three miles away to Roseland north end of Indian River County that I went to uh, Vero Beach High School. But I came here, though, not for grad school. I, I did all my, I came here as a freshman. Mm -hmm. So I started as a freshman and went clean through grad school here. And you served during World War II. Can you talk about your experiences as a, uh, in the military? Well, I was a medic mm -hmm. and I served on an Army hospital ship. And uh, we went between New York and uh, London, or New York and Lahore and uh, Cherbourg, France, to pick up patients. So we we picked up patients out of the D-Day and out of the Battle of Bulge, and wow. so we had we had a big ship, over seventeen hundred beds, and uh, so uh, we bring them back to the states, and we had really three classes of patients. We had those that were that, that were coming home to die and that sounds cruel, under the law at that time, if you died overseas, you were buried overseas. That's why you have these great huge cemeteries in Europe. In fact, General Patton, mm -hmm. who died in, uh, after the war was over, he died in Europe. He's buried in Europe, even though his family petitioned for him to be buried in the States. The law was that if you die overseas, you're buried there. Unlike today when they fly you home and so forth. But you got to remember, this is 75, 80 years ago. So we had some of those patients there. They were trying to get home so they could die at home or die in the States. Then their family could bury them at home. And uh, we would have ever, occasionally someone would die aboard ship because they just didn't make it back. Mm -hmm. And our ship, we just took eight days to cross. And then we had the second type that was coming home uh, to probably go into a hospital here to a military hospital in the States. And depending on the, you know, the condition, the severity of their injuries, some may never get out of the military. They'd be in a military hospital, you know, the rest of their lives, or they might be in for some period of time till they were healed enough to be discharged. Then you had a few who would come, become home who uh, might go back to service. Probably not. We had a, many amputees, in fact, I'd say probably the majority of our patients were amputees, mm -hmm. arms, legs, everything shot off. And they would be, some of them, some of them would go home because they weren't gonna go back into service. Some of them had to go to stateside hospital because we had military hospitals in the States and they'd go to those hospitals and maybe stay there, maybe not, but, it, but some, most of the amputees would ultimately get out of the hospital but uh, most of our patients were, they were all seriously injured people. Interesting. Were you going to go into the medical field or were you planning to after the military? No. <laughs> In those days, you didn't select your service like right. they can do today. They take you and they put you where they want to. They put you there where you had no choice. You had a choice maybe uh, that way you went to Marines, Coast Guard, Navy, or Army. Uh, if you were if you were volunteering now if you were drafted you were drafted into the army uh, but they put you where they wanted you right. as an example one of the guys i went in with from vero uh, he was 26 i was 18 but he worked on a pharmacy 
he was not a registered pharmacist yet, and he hoped to go into the medics because part of the medics was where pharmacy went. I had been a Boy Scout signal person, semaphore and so forth, and, and, and the Morse code and everything as a Boy Scout, pretty good at it. And I hoped to go into the signal corps. Well, they put him in the signal corps and put me in the medics. Right. You thought, you'd have thought the Army would have looked at my, my uh, record of my numbers and said, oh, this guy should go to the signal corps. This one should go to the medics. Well, they didn't. So he goes to the signal corps and I went to the medics. So I had no desire to stay in the medical field. It was, huh. if you, or if you don't like it, it's not a field to go into. Right. I must say this, though, that you do, you get accustomed to it. I was just lucky I was not a field medic, the kind that's right out on the field, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, treat an injured right at that point. Uh, we had, if you want to say good duty, we might, you might say we had good duty, that ours were, ours were already at a position where they, uh, they were no longer in danger of, uh, of dying other than those who were trying to die, you know, at home. They weren't taking, they weren't needing a lot of care because they, they wouldn't have to stay at a hospital overseas until they got to that point. So we had good duty, if you want to call it duty, but they were all injured people. Right, right. And we also had on our ship, we had one section for what we, we referred to it as the psycho section of all the kids who were mentally damaged from the war. They had to be put in a separate, like a psycho hospital, wow. psychiatric hospital. Mm. Yeah. Well, after the war, you enrolled at the University of Miami. Correct. And you uh, you started attending games. In 1946 was your right. first year of uh, attending games. Um, what do you remember about the Orange Bowl back then? I believe at that time it was called Burdine Stadium. Is that true? And it was yeah. it was a lot different back in those days. Yes, it was called the Roddy Burdine Stadium. Mm -hmm. Roddy Burdine was well, Burdine's store. Mm -hmm. His name was R O D D E Y. Roddy Burdine. Mm -hmm. First game I went the Orange Bowl though was New Year's Day of 1939, when Tennessee played Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. Tennessee won 17 nothing. Then I didn't see a University of Miami game, any, any other game in the Orange Bowl until 46 when I came down here. And then I, well, I take that back. I did see a couple more Orange Bowl games. I saw the 1940 game. And if, I guess I marched in the 1941 Orange Bowl. My, the Vero Beach Band came yeah. down for, for the Orange Bowl parade. And I was in the Vero Beach Band. And then we marched at half. Well, we were on the field for the pre-game program that they had at the Orange Bowl event. And I'll never will forget Frankie Sinkwich, kid from Youngstown, Ohio, who was a Heisman Trophy winner at Georgia, mm -hmm. halfback. Uh, we were surrounding the field at the pre-game. Right. And in the middle of the field, the, guy, the team was working out, you know. And all of a sudden, they broke to go back to the locker room. And Frankie Sinkwich walked right by, right by me as they came as I walked through the band, you know. And the funny thing, I, I was taller than Sinkwich. I said, I couldn't believe, here's a guy who's a Heisman Trophy winner, but he was, a, I was about six feet then, he was about 5'10", but it was amazing. Here's this All-American Heisman winner, right. and he's smaller than I am, but he was about 185 pounds, so I mean, but, but he walked by, I could, I could look at him my level, you might say. Wow, you talk about that Orange Bowl game of Frank Sinkwich, and that was one of the great performances at that time ever in the Orange Bowl game. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular games that stand out in your mind from all the past 76 years of going to, going to games at the Orange Bowl and, and University of Miami games? Well, I, I, I didn't see this game, but I think it ought to be mentioned. The, 40, the 46 game, which was a 45 season, I, I didn't see that. I was still in service. It was with Al Hudson mm. again when we beat Holy Cross. Uh, the score was tied. You probably know, you've probably seen that film, but yes. if you recall, the score was tied six to six. Uh, Holy Cross had the ball our 25 yard line on the last play of the game. And a guy named Stan Kozlowski was the, they didn't call the quarterback. He was actually the tailback in those mm. days in the single wing, dropped back to throw the ball. Of course, I'm listening to it, 
in New York then because I'm, I'm back in the States. Right. And I just were, and all of a sudden, Al Hudson, who was an 18-year-old freshman defensive back, happens to intercept the ball on our 11-yard line and goes 89 yards yeah. for the winning touchdown. Right. And the clocks ended the game at about the 40-yard line, 45-yard line. Of course, he gets to score that play. That's probably the greatest game in Orange Bowl history. Right. And uh, so we won the game 12-6. to six. Well, no, we won it 13-6, I think they – kick the extra point. Why? I don't know. They don't do that today. <laughs> On that, they wouldn't bother to go right. for the extra point. That has to go down. as one, To me, is one of the great bowl game in history of all bowl games. You know, sure. Somebody to win like that. I, I was concerned here some years ago. I saw a thing on, I guess it was on the computer, a listing of all the great, what they call the great plays of bowl games. Uh-huh. And they didn't show that one. I couldn't believe that they didn't show that because the Orange Bowl, they were, those days, there were only five bowls. Rose Bowl, Cotton Bowl, Sugar Bowl, Orange Bowl, and the Sun Bowl in El Paso, Texas. Hmm. Those were the only five bowls you had in those days, <laughs> no more. So I don't know how in the world they didn't use the Al Hudson run as one of the great games. I think we're all a prisoner of recency, and we always remember yeah. the stuff that we, that most people recall from their childhood. or yeah. And... I guess a lot of people don't go back that far, and uh, but you were from a time where when the Orange Bowl was a lot different than it than it later became. Like it was a single deck stadium Correct. at the time, right. and I think it got double decked around 1947, and the this double the the upper deck opened up in 1948. Do you remember some of the changes that you saw at the Orange Bowl over the years? Yeah, and I, oh, I, think, I remember Gus Newberg was was a contractor that. Uh, did the double decking? Well, the, yeah, before the double decking, I think they had about thirty-two thousand there right. in the early thirty thousands. That first game I saw it, I sat in the end zone. That's what that was the cheapest ticket. I might tell you, I remember the ticket for the game. Uh, somebody gave that to me for a mm-hmm. Christmas present. The ticket was uh, three dollars and a half for an end zone ticket. Right. And uh, then later on, they, I, I started going to the games for fifteen dollars. Well, the the Orange Bowl was built after that in stages. You know, they uh, say that first they double decked it, and the double decking wasn't as big as it got later. And then they closed, ultimately closed in the east end zone, and uh, then the, well, no, I should say closed it in. They they used the east end zone and west end zone. Uh, but they were configured, they were set up in the open end zones like they'd been earlier on, much more compact. And uh, in fact, in uh, 1946, there was the All-American Conference and football was formed. It was the Miami Seahawks, right? And they were the Miami yeah, Seahawks. Sure. They played on Monday nights. Yeah. And I went, I went to five of their seven home games, but they played on Monday nights. Everybody thought it was crazy. And they only averaged about 15,000 fans. So uh, Harvey Hester, a guy from Atlanta, owned them. And so they, they, after the first year, they moved out of here. But it's funny how people think Monday Night Football started in, with Paul Christman and those guys that are announcing for ABC. Right. And uh, what they was the late, well, what, early 70s, whenever the uh, AFL started. But uh, actually, Monday Night Football started in, in, our, in the Orange Bowl in 1946. Wow. I mean, you, you just mentioned the Miami Seahawks. A lot of people don't know that the Seahawks were the first professional football team in, or major professional football team in Miami. Um, everybody thinks it's the Dolphins, but right. the Seahawks came 20 years before the Dolphins did. Right. And uh, um, talk about um, over the years, um, you've, You've, you've attended countless UM games, and you've seen g- guys from Jim Dooley, Don yeah. Bossler, George Myra, Ted Hendricks, I mean, Otis Anderson, all the way down to, you know, to recently, more recent, like Ken Dorsey or, yeah. or Edgerin James, is the, or Ted Hendricks. I mean, are there is there a player that to you kind of just uh, is, is the face of UM football to you, or is there a player that well, I'd who's say the best that- player? The quarterback I, I thought was the best quarterback to me, like most, most was Ken Dorsey. Hmm. 
I thought Dorsey was the. It's his birthday today, by the way. Was that right? Yeah. Twenty second. Forty one years old. I'll be all gone. <laughs> Doesn't seem possible. Yeah. He was my favorite of all the quarterbacks, although I, I knew some of them. I knew George Morrow well. I know George Morrow. I haven't seen George in a while, but uh, Sam Skarnecki, who's in the Hall of Fame, I sat with Sam last night at the uh, Hall of Fame dinner. Sam is now eighty-seven years old. Right. He and Don Bosley played together. In fact, I talked to Bosley on the phone about two weeks ago. Hmm. He's moved to Atlanta now. Uh, his son is a head of a big law firm in Atlanta, and so Don, well, his wife Marcia called me, and Don was there, so she put Don on the phone. So I had, I had not talked to Don in some years. He was a kid. He came from Batavia, New York. Right. And that that was a great class. The Gus had had a coach. Gus had had a bad year in '52. We were two and eight. It was a bad season. Hmm. So he went out that fall and did a real recruiting job and he recruited Bossler, uh, Tommy Pratt, who became a great player to go, and a pro coach for years and years. You you may have met Tommy, I don't know. Uh, as I say, Don Dorsheim, Jack Johnson, who became a, a an end and a punter in the big leagues for year in the NFL for years. Charlie Hutchings, a big tackle out of Chicago. Porky Oliver, Rebel Buckman. Buckman became a good back in the defensive back, uh, he recruited a heck of a class that year. And so in 53, we improved to four and six from, from two and eight. But then we got on that run, which took us in 56, you, you probably know, we, we wound up six in the nation right. uh, on the AP poll. And that was the highest we were ever ranked, ranked until we won the championship. Mm. In '83, but that class had Sam Skarnacki at quarterback of that for that season. Boxer was, the, of course, star fullback, and Boxer went on as a first-round draft choice, Washington Redskins. And uh, if, <laughs> it's too bad he's not here to tell the story himself. He was second in rookie of the year. To Jim Brown, second. I think, right? Yeah, was Jim it Jim Brown, Brown or Paul no, Horning? No, no, Jim Brown. Jim Brown, yeah. He was, but like he said, Jim Brown got like all but, all but one first base vote or something. <laughs> but uh, Don was second. Don played uh, eight years in the pros. Mm. And I asked him one time, many years ago, when he knew it was time to quit, he well, he said, it comes on your gradual. First year he's a rookie, you're all excited. Second or third year is still good. About the fifth year, you started to feel it. Mm. So used to, you'd play on Sunday off on Monday. And then you... Uh, have either go watch film or something Tuesday and Wednesday. It's, it's a light week and you might work out on a little bit on Thursday and Friday. And he said, yeah, I felt good. But by the fourth or fifth year, it started taking me, I wasn't ready to work mm -hmm. to go back in on Tuesday. And uh, by at the end of seven years, he said, I, I, it was, I was doing it was time to quit your body. It just takes too long to heal. Mm -hmm. And he's a fullback at the kind of, Offense around those days, he was getting hit on every play, whether yeah. he had the ball or not, right. getting pounded. And uh, so uh, he was, but he, Don was a great one. Right, right. Yeah. From 19, from the late 30s to about the early 60s, UM only had two head coaches, Jack Harding and Andy Gustafson. Well, yes and, and no. During the war, Harding went into yeah. service. Okay. So in 43 and 44, Eddie Dunn coached. Eddie mm. was the assistant. One of his he also assistants. coached baseball too, right? Yeah, he right. was a baseball mm -hmm. coach after the war. And then, uh, so Harding Harding was the coach, then oh. done there for four years, and Harding came back. Mm -hmm. So people t tend to forget that Eddie Dunn was in there those two years when Harding was in World War II. But through those years, Miami was a lot different as a city back then. Um, one of the things was is that that entire time uh the the program was was segregated um yeah. but in but in 1967 charlie tate brought the first african-american player ray bellamy talk about how miami was changing in the 60s and the inclusion of african-americans into the program well that's now that's a long story so mm -hmm. it all began with the uh, 1954 supreme court decision mm -hmm. on brown versus board of education in kansas 
on school desegregation. And uh, at, until that time, all the schools were segregated in the South. And in fact, let me add here, uh, no, no black could play against a white in the Orange Bowl. That was city of Miami rules. Uh, and in, 19, in fact, in go way back in 1936, uh, the, the <clears throat> city of Miami, the Quantas did, I guess it was, sponsored a Christmas night game right. against a, some northern crack high school team against Miami Senior High. Right. And they played Oak Park River Forest Township High School then out right. of Chicago, out of Oak Park. And they had a black, their star running back was black, mm -hmm. and he didn't get to play and by the score this tie game, he uh, he just refused to play because it was in my. I believe his name was Lou Pope, and he. I don't remember his name. I, right? I read about his story, oh, and okay. he listened to the game at home on the radio. He was yeah. unable to play in the game, and the game right. ended in a tie too. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Penn State wouldn't play us one year right. uh, because it was, they they had a black kid, and they they wouldn't allow him to play, so they weren't they didn't play the game. And UCLA when they had Jackie Robinson. Yeah, I heard it's fun to say. I, I saw that someplace. I don't mm. ever rem remember that. Mm. For some reason, I have no recollection at all of Jackie Robinson ever being, any, I mean, anything about UCLA, but must have. Somebody said it did, but I never, I just don't recall that at all. Right. Now, but when uh, we talk about desegregation, yeah. you played a huge part in desegregating Dade County schools. When you were a, me you were a member of the Dade County Public School Board, and you played a huge part in that. Um, can you talk about how difficult that process was? Because I had heard that you had received death threats at the yeah, time yeah. and a lot of threats against you uh, about that decision to desegregate schools. Well, that's true. I mean, it, it, People down here did not want desegregation, and that was that was true all across the South. Uh, and so we we were going to desegregate. I happened to be chairman of the board at that time, so I was the point person, uh, and I guess I'm the one most identified with it. And it, as an aside, I guess I almost every day for, for months and months. I'd go out to get my newspaper, it'd be a radio announcer, somebody wanted to tape or one of the television stations there or something. It, it, it was that way the whole time. And uh, in fact, a poll was taken at that time, the most recognizable name in Dade County was my name mm -hmm. because I was on there all the time. People just w livid over the whole DC. You're right. I uh, My office in the Gables was in the Gables at that time. I used to always call my wife when I was leaving the office to go home. And so this one day I called her, said I'm on my way. And about, about that time I got a phone call. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the, a, a rabid person. And I was on the phone probably 20 or 30 minutes. And we, I hung up and I forgot to recall my wife. And so I had gotten in the car, drove home. As I drove in the garage, she comes running out of the out of the patio into the garage. I said, where have you been? I what do you mean? She said, just after you called, I got a call. You weren't going to arrive home alive. Oh wow! <laughs> and I'm about thirty minutes later. So, uh, and then we had to put a we had a f extra phone line at the house because of all the, the threatening phone calls I got. So, uh, what would happen if I if, say if I answered the, if I answered the phone? There's a threatening call. My wife was to pick up the other phone mm -hmm. that we had and call a particular number that the police had given us. State attorney set all that up, I guess. And uh, then, uh, then at that, I was to hold a person on the line long enough for that to take effect, you know. Or if my wife answered the phone, then she was to keep them on the line long enough for me to call that other line. And so they would, somehow they'd get a hold of people, they could trace that call and so forth. You were you were really a vision visionary, a really ahead of your time, because you were also a proponent for bilingualism in schools, yeah. and of course, G. Braddock, uh, G. Holmes Braddock High School opened in 1989, yeah. and it, today it has over 3,000 students, and I believe I believe 91 percent are Hispanic. Roughly and, that, yeah. Right. Actually, a funny thing back about. In the early 90s, it was the largest school in the United States. They had 
just between 52 and 5300. Oh, wow. And I happened to go to a national convention, and uh, which you have all kinds of vendors at these things. They're huge. And there's one vendor we went by, and my wife and I were walking by, and it was a vendor that sold uh, uh, various educational publications. They had one education weekly. It was one of the, it was a tabloid paper, but it was an education paper. And I just had to walk in there and learn it. It's displayed. This particular issue is displayed on one of the desk uh, tables. It had Braddock High School, largest in the United States. Wow. That's the first time I knew it was the largest. And uh, so I looked at it and then I didn't know what to do. I, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I, did, I wanted to t tell the guy. So finally I walked over to him and I had a name tag on. I just pointed to my name tag. He looked at it, didn't mean anything because he, he wasn't associated with the newspaper he had laid out, you know. So then I showed the paper, and then and then we had a nice long conversation. But it was that time they had it down as the largest high school in the United States, which is nothing to brag about because a, a large high school like that, it, it, that's built for 3,000, mm. means you're packed in there. <laughs> well, I got to ask you this. What is it like to have a high school named after you and, I mean, uh, and and not only that, I think I think what's amazing is that the high school has now been around for. Let me see that it opened in 1989, so right. we're talking about 33 years. Yeah. So if you if you if you really think about it, the original students from back then probably have kids that have graduated from the school more recently. I mean, you've left quite a legacy over at that school. What 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 is that like to have? something like that named after you when usually that happens to a person that's deceased. <laughs> well, that's a funny, a funny story. I went into a store one time. Now, this is years ago, 25, 30 years ago now. And I paid something with my credit card. There was a young man at the cashier, and he looked down at the credit card, and he says, are you G. Holmes Braddock? And I, I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, man, I thought you were dead. <laughs> oh no i said well maybe i'm dead and don't know it you know so uh i, I get that freak uh, not frequently anymore but i used to get it periodically that uh, people just assumed i was dead one thing the school has done though since i only live a mile and a half from it uh they keep me involved some uh, in functions they the scholarship day they have each year they invite me to that they the ROTC has a big function every year and invite me to that. And I, I go to the baseball games, not all of them, but I've been to three or four of them this year already. Oh, wow. And uh, they try to keep me involved, which is nice. And uh, I appreciate it. And But you're right. I've run across a lot of people now. I ran across a guy here, well, I guess three or four weeks ago. He was in the second graduating class. Mm. Yeah. And now they, they're probably... Well, I mean, they probably know, I guess, late 40s, some of them now, I guess. Yeah. But uh, except for last year when it was a pandemic, no graduation two years ago. They didn't have graduations hmm. at the high school. Last year they had graduations, but no no people to shake hands or anything <laughs> at all. But going th outside of those two years, I've shaken hands with every single kid that graduated wow. from Braddock who went through the graduation. Now, some kids don't bother to go through graduation area. You'll have some that <laughs> poo poo it, just won't go through the graduation ceremony. But for every single kid who's gone through a graduation, that they've had people shake their hands. I've shaken hands with every kid. Do they know who you are? Because you know, when well, you go when you go all over Miami, you'll be on you you you'll be on like the Julia Tuttle Causeway, or you'll be on uh, uh, the the Flagler Street. These are these or or you might watch a football game at Travis Powell Stadium. These are these are landmarks that are named after like really big important people in Miami. And you have a school named after you. What is the significance of that? I mean, uh, to to have you know to have a landmark named after you and be a part of Miami's unique history. Well, obviously, it makes you feel good. It makes you, I guess, feel that maybe what you tried to do was appreciated. My mother, who was a school teacher for 41 years, she came down, it was just, just before she died, 
I took her by the school and it was school was under construction then and uh, was not going to open for another couple of years. And she and my mother was a person of a few words. And she turned to one and said, that's that's pretty nice. She said for a kid who used to go to school barefooted because yeah. uh, people don't realize this. I'm a product of the Depression and times were tough for everybody. In a small town of Sebastian, Florida, where I was, uh, we, we were small town kids. Mm -hmm. And even up through the ninth grade, uh, we'd go to school barefooted oh, wow. from, say, uh, up until about November, then maybe it started again in May. During the wintertime, you, uh, we had to put shoes on because of weather. But other than that, we'd go to even eighth and ninth grade boys going to school barefooted because people didn't have the money to to have that many pairs of shoes. I want a uh, couple of things that I want to close out with. Uh, it's a two part question. Um, uh, what are you most proud of uh, in terms of what you've accomplished and how would you like to be remembered? Well, I guess most, I assume I'm most proud of the fact that, that the people, the powers to be, so to speak, thought enough of me and thought my contributions were worthy of having a school name after me. That mm. has to be probably the most the thing I'm proudest of. To be remembered, I guess I'd like to be remembered as someone who tried to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I never ever said I did the right thing. That puts me up as God. I always said I did I thought I did what I thought was the right thing because uh, and tried to treat people fairly and honestly and serve my clients in the insurance business the same way. I'd like to be remembered as that, and uh, if, I, if that happens, it is, I'm, I'm very happy. Wow. And, and I want to let everybody know that you're still very active in the Miami community. You are on the board of directors for the University of Miami Sports Hall of Fame, which you're right. representing right now. Right. And uh, you, last night, talk about a little briefly a little about last night. You guys just uh, introduced the new class of, uh, of Hall of Famers to the, uh, to the U. Yeah, we had over 400 people there last night at the, at the dinner. And we brought in two classes because the 19, the 2020 class, we had already selected them, but the pandemic closed everything down before we could have the banquet. And we didn't have one for 2021. So we brought in the 20 class and the 22 class last night, two classes. And that was a total of 18 uh, athletes. And the one thing people tend to think, some people do that, that's just a football Hall of Fame. Right. But it's for all sports, both right. boys and girls, the men and women, see? So it's not just the men thing. We had a number of uh, female athletes that were brought in last night. So it was a great, it was a great night as always. Uh, people have a lot of fun and we, en we enjoy doing this a lot of work uh, to, put together, to put it together a, a dinner like that. I think a lot of people like you just I just wanted to touch on what you just said, like everybody thinks of it as a football Hall of Fame, but yeah. people forget there are a lot of great athletes in other sports. People like Rick Berry, Greg Luganis, yeah. Lauren Williams. You were talking about uh, female athletes. Right. I mean, so many athletes from different sports that are in that Hall of Fame that maybe people didn't even know went to the University of Miami. That's right. Yeah. In fact, we brought in last night Yasmani Grandal, mm -hmm. who right now, you know, is a first string catch of the Chicago White Sox. Sure. But we've had some baseball players come in also, great baseball players. And uh, like you say, basketball, track, uh, swimming. You mentioned Greg Luganis is an Olympic diver. And uh, But you're right, though. Most, not maybe, many people think of it as strictly a football. football. <laughs> so football gets all the publicity, right. you know. And uh, But it's no, it covers all sports. So it means that it's tough to get in. Because I think like what one class had two football players, the other one had three. Mm. They came in last night. Now, of all the great football players that are going through here, uh, it's tough to get in. Okay. You know, it's going to take a long time for some of them to get in. Well, Holmes, thank you for thank you so much for dropping by mm -hmm. uh, for our show. You've been an awesome guest, and I want to wish you good luck on your endeavors with the UM Sports Hall of Fame. And anytime you want to come back, just let me know. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> Always enjoyed talking about university because I was there a long time, worked there, and of course, the students there stayed active there. Great, great, great. Thanks so Thanks. much for joining us. Yeah. For, go, for the Ghost of the Orange Bowl, 
I'm Jay Ralph from Miami's Community News, and we'll see you.